uh, we, we uh, welcome everybody to our midweek Bible study and hope that um, you um, are having an opportunity to watch this taped. And uh, it's good to see everybody and know that you're going to be here uh, in, in during the next week to continue our study in Jonah. So let's pray and we'll look a little bit at chapter two tonight. God, thank you for allowing us to gather. And Lord, uh, whether we're together live or the many that will watch this during the week or later on, Lord, uh, just open up your word to us for whatever uh, we uh, watch and partake of this Bible study. It'll be your spirit that teaches us. Thank you for your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, well, we left off into chapter one. We're going to pick up with Jonah's, his own autobiography a little bit here, his own story. And this is the way he's sharing his prophecy in a narrative form. And so we left and Jonah uh, was thrown overboard at his own request. And uh, we saw at the end of chapter one that as he's thrown over, he doesn't drown, but God provides a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And he's in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. And so chapter two opens up with what Jonah does in the belly of the fish. It says, then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish. So uh, Jonah is swallowed, and this part of, of Jonah, of the four chapters, is um, really at the center of the prophecy, of the center of, of Jonah telling about what God wants to get across. And it also really speaks to us as we look at Jonah in the belly of the fish and Jonah's prayer. The, I think the Lord, the big truth here, it shares with us the journey, his journey and our journey of the, the I guess the contrast of just living for ourselves versus are we gonna to live to become the person God is calling us to be? And the only way we can become the men and the women that God wants us to be and to carry out his task for us is to begin with prayer. And that's what Jonah does. And uh, when we begin with prayer, when we really, get serious about this journey to follow God's will for our life. And, and, and maybe even it's as strong as the journey that we're really sensing God calling us to something special. We're really, or we're feeling that Lord is calling us to do something different than we are doing as far as ministry is concerned, or uh, the ministry we do in our church or with our family or with our neighbors. And normally that prayer journey begins like it did with Jonah. It begins with the prayer and we feel like we're in that tight, confined place. In other words, usually this, this, this journey or this unsettledness or this anxiousness that that somehow God is speaking to us and telling us something he really wants us to do. And we begin praying about that. It starts as a very uncomfortable place in our life. We're almost, it's not troubled in that, that we're worried, but we're troubled because we don't clearly understand what God's doing in our life right now or what he's calling us towards, or maybe while, why we are going through something uh, in this part of our life. And so we begin to pray, and 
as Jonah's praying in the tightly confined belly of the fish. Sometimes it feels that, that way for us. I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but we just feel like, boy, it's just, it's just me and God, and I just feel all alone right now. And that's the way John, Jonah feels. Sometimes these can be times of doubt in our life when we feel this way. Maybe it's time of pain, physical pain, emotional pain. Uh, maybe we've just gone through a catastrophe in life, and maybe we've gone through a sudden change, a sudden change in lifestyle, a, a sudden change um, in our family. And whatever brings it on, uh, it's what we will do with these disturbing moments uh, are going to be critical with our relationship with God. And what happens next? And all of this searching and all of this, um, this trying to understand what's happening and the way to come out of this on the victorious side has to be won and dealt with in prayer. And that's the way it is with most victorious outcomes in our lives. Uh, vic victory, spiritual victory, just does not happen without that solitude time of prayer. And what I mean is that it doesn't just happen praying with friends, praying at church with a group, uh, praying with a trusted person, but we've got to put that alone time in with God. Uh, clarity of God's will in our life doesn't happen without this alone time with God. Spiritual growth doesn't occur unless we're willing to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with God. Uh, neither does new vision. We're stuck in life and we want something new and we want something exciting and, and that just doesn't Usually, it doesn't come like a, like sometimes we see in the movies or read in the book with an epiphany, <laughs> you know, with an explosion. It, it, it happens um, because it's began with deep prayer and a deep relationship with the Heavenly Father. So without prayer, even though it feels uncomfortable, it, it sometimes... Um, uh, we're made aware of some things in our life that we haven't dealt with in a long time. Without prayer in these lonely, confined places of our souls, there really can be no spiritual energy in our life. This is where we gain the spiritual energy to do what God wants us to do. And so if we know this, and if we see men and women of scripture that find this energy this way, what keeps every believer from um, participating in this kind of prayer? What keeps us from spending these more extended lonely moments with God and building up that fellowship? This one-on-one -on -one, uh, time with God is where we really work on ourselves and where we really don't work on anybody else. And when we know we're in these deep moments of prayer, and we'll see with Jonah's prayer, you know, we're, we're working on our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We're working on us. How can we know God better? Um, how can we worship in a greater way? How can the Lord reveal to us uh, what we need to confess or what we need to change or add or take away from our life? Uh, the one thing that keeps us from doing this is that what Paul calls our human nature 
and what some call the whisper of the evil one <laughs> tries to convince us of the opposite. And the opposite is we can figure all this stuff out and succeed on our own. We don't need God to do it. We don't want to give up what makes us feel good. And a lot of times for us, that's being with others or, or um, only worshiping and only having a time with God uh, at our church or in our small group or Bible study. Or we, our spirituality begins to center around, we only care what others think about. And so if I'm seen in worship, if I'm, if I'm seen doing good things, then that makes me feel good. Therefore, God must be pleased with what I'm doing. And when we do that, we just never make room for this real personal quiet time with God. In fact, look at the New Testament letters written after, you know, during the book of Acts and in the end of the New Testament. Some of the most powerful letters, uplifting letters, uh, deep letters, were written when the writers were forced to be alone with God. Some of Paul's best letters, Philippians, First and Second Timothy, Titus, a Jew, were written while he was in prison, forced to be alone with God. The book of Revelation and that great vision God gave John was received and written as John was exiled on the island of Patmos by himself. It's amazing sometimes how clear we can become with our relationship and God speaking to us when we are isolated with just he and I. And so with that in mind, uh, Jonah in the belly of the fish prays. And as we look at that, we look at that prayer in that way, I'm gonna read the prayer, it's not that long, and realize uh, this as I read it, is that, and we won't go into this in detail, but if you have a good study Bible, it might tell you. But basically, Jonah prays the Psalms. Almost every line of his prayer comes from the book of Psalms. So here's his prayer. I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought me up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. So Jonah, what does he, how does he spend this time alone with God, this very solitary time? What does he pray? He prays from the Psalms. And I think that's a great lesson to us. And it's interesting, there's different 
themes of the Psalms. But the Psalms, a lot of times, are lament are laments. They're they're prayers of of David and others who are real sorrowful at the time, who grieve, who are suffering. And that's kind of what we would expect Jonah to pray. But instead, after acknowledging where he is in his journey and where he is uh, confined, most of Jonah's prayer, he reaches to the Psalms of thanksgiving to God. And he prays prayers of praise to God. I'm not sure if I would expect him to choose those psalms to pray. And it kind of um, maybe gives us a, a clue to when we know that we're drawing closer to God, and more importantly, when our faith is maturing. Immature faith, immature prayer focuses on self. Immature prayer only prays, Lord, woe is me, or Lord, here's my wish list today. Oh, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm always despondent. I'm always sad. Lord, I'm hurting. Lord, I need this. Lord, I need this miracle in my life for me. And the immature the one that is not maturing in their deeper relationship with God, that's as far as their prayer goes. Versus as our prayer becomes more mature, as our relationship with God becomes more mature and deepens, as we become more and more familiar with the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll notice our prayers focus much more not on ourselves, but on God. Our prayers, the, the, our prayers really, most of our prayers focus on thanksgiving to God for who he is and praising God and Jesus for who he is. And Jonah, even though he's in the midst of disobedience here and he's kind of coming around <laughs> being forced to, we sense that Jonah, uh, even from the beginning, that's why God called him, Jonah really does want and has a deep relationship with God. Even those with deep relationships still sin. But it's interesting, his prayer focuses on thanksgiving and praise and recognizing the power of God. And so, um, it's, I think it's important if you want to know what to pray, if you want to know how to pray, if, if you want a formula to pray, pray the Psalms. Jesus quotes the Psalms. Paul quotes the Psalms. Peter, John, James quote the Psalms. And for centuries, Christians and believers have known the spiritual value of praying the Psalms. <clears throat> and as we pray the Psalms, the Psalms are, are really not to be used mostly for um, just to read and uh, to, uh, to read just devotional. The Psalms can be read, they can be studied, they can be used devotionally. They're not to be read um, just for their romantic poetic style, although they are beautiful pieces of literature. They're not effective to pray through, just taking them on the surface. But the best way to take advantage of the Psalms is to deeply pray them and to pray them slowly and to think about each line, to pray a line, to pray a few words 
and then really meditate. Lord, what are you saying to me in this song? Or what truth is it that you're sharing now? The Psalms will fill the well of our soul with God. Prayer, prayerlessness, or if we realize that our life has become prayerless for a time, it usually comes because we're, our spiritual well is empty. It usually comes because we just haven't been filling, uh, filling our cup, filling our well with the word of God in our prayers and filling the well up with enough praise and thanksgiving to God. And the best place to find those things is the book of Psalms. So uh, some great men and women of our faith that we now look back at their writings and see what a deep spiritual experience they had in life. What many of them did was that they prayed through the Psalms in sequence every day. They started with the first Psalm and you know that, that day was Psalm one and they prayed through it. The next day, the second Psalm and on and on and on. Yeah, it might take them a couple of days to get through Psalm 119, which is so long. But when they finished Psalm 150, they went back and they began praying again. I remember reading a quote even from a modern day giant, spiritual giant, Billy Graham, who said the same thing. He said, he read the Psalms for worship. He read a Psalm a day. And he read a proverb a day for wisdom. A psalm for prayer and worship and a proverb for wisdom. Jonah shows us this centuries ago. And this individual contemplative prayer, again, it's the beginning of being able to be really used by God. And sometimes um, we feel like when we get to that point of prayer and needing it, it's the end of our journey. But deep prayer based on God's word is the starting point. It can be the place of a new beginning in life. So this alone, confined, restricted field of contemplative prayer uh, moves us closer to the Lord. And one of the, uh, interestingly enough, this, this contemplative prayer, this alone prayer, this being alone also moves us. God puts in us as we grow closer to him the desire not to only want to be alone, we get so overwhelmed with the presence of God and, and with the love of God, it drives us towards a community of faith. It drives us towards wanting to be in a worship service, at least weekly. It makes us want to be around others and praise God together with a group, with a church, with another body of Christ. So lonely prayer doesn't keep us there, but lonely prayer, deep prayer, we're working on us and our relationship with God motivates and drives us forward. Just like Jesus alone in the belly of the fish type of prayer he had to do in the wilderness when he was tempted by Satan. When that time was over, the Bible says, Jesus left the wilderness and went into the world and began his ministry. So this type of prayer moves us towards active service and active ministry. It doesn't keep us in hiding. It doesn't make us want to be more alone. It makes us want to go and share. And that's what happens with Jonah, isn't it? 
Jonah's telling his story of his journey with God. And immediately after he finishes this prayer, the, sec the tenth verse, the last verse of the second chapter, says this, doesn't it? Then, after he prayed, then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. After Jonah's earnest prayer, the fish spews Jonah back onto land, where now he can get on with God's call, where now he can get on with God's work where now he can start and stop running towards the glamour of Tarshish and towards the sin city of Nineveh with the message of God. So he's ready to do what God calls him to do. And we'll look at that beginning of that time at Nineveh and what happens next week when we are together. But for this week, if you take anything out, just commit to those that more alone, solitude time with God. And try praying through the Psalms like Jonah did. And see if God doesn't speak to you. I hope to see you next week as we continue to look at this short but powerful prophetic book of Jonah. God bless.